and Joel Moore, uh, the next uh, speaker presentation presenter of the next lecture. So Joel um, has, uh, of course, very well known, um, like uh, the speaker before, and um, so he did his undergraduate um, time in Princeton, where he started working with a certain Duncan Haldane. Then he went to um, MIT, where he worked with Zhao Gang Wen. After that, Bell Labs, and then I think directly to Berkeley. I've actually forgotten that now, where he's stayed ever since. Um, so he's done really a lot of work. Um, can't even list everything. So very famously, three-dimensional topological insulators, um, um, a term which he was, in, uh, and the word topological insulator itself. But there's really plenty of other stuff, um, not just um, the topic of today's talk on electron dynamics and ultra clean solids, but also various RG things, um, electron transport in other settings, um, integrable systems and things like that. Okay, um, he's also the co-author of a little known book on topological phases of matter, which was concluded as part of the lockdown. <laughs> Another long running project, which was finally pushed out of the door as so we much look forward to your, um, uh, to your talk. So um, we have had so far just people interrupt the speaker. So if that's okay with you, we'll continue with that. And you can also write uh, questions in the, um, in the chat um, if you don't want to interrupt. Okay, Joel, go ahead, thanks. That sounds great. Thank you for the generous intro. And please do interrupt. Um, I may not immediately notice things. So shout if I don't see a hand raised or something like that. Uh, I don't have as many detailed derivations as the previous speaker, I have to admit. But if something doesn't make sense, please ask and I'll try to explain where it comes from or at least point you to where more of the details are provided. Um, and it, it, it's great to see so many people online. Uh, I guess that's an advantage of being virtual. So. I guess uh, what I'd like to do is, is talk about dynamics in solids uh, and, and how maybe the solid background, it could do some boring things, uh, but it can also do some interesting things. And I, I'm going to focus more on the interesting things um, and how that affects our ability to observe interesting kinds of dynamics. So if you're at the school, hopefully you're developing an interest in, in quantum dynamics. Uh, electrons are a nice quantum mechanical particle, whether you think about the whole electron or just its spin. So we can ask when we go to solids, and I'm gonna focus on very clean solids uh, in this talk, so I don't need to think about localization, although it is a beautiful quantum or at least wave property. Um, when we go to a very clean solid, how would we expect dynamical properties uh, to be interesting? Uh, maybe because they're modified by the solid background, uh, maybe because we could start to realize because of interactions, say, some of the neat physics in the previous talk. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a, a couple of different things as a result. Uh, so I want to remind you, first of all, what is our kind of standard model for how things move around in a solid? And I, I'll be talking about electrons and spins primarily. Um, and then why might those break down in some cases? Uh, in particular, one thing that will come up in the second part of the talk is, where would we expect to get electrons that behave more like a fluid? And how is that different from how they normally behave? Um, and then if we do get electrons behaving like a fluid, we know from the previous talk that they could be a special kind of fluid, maybe because of integrability, um, but there are other things that can happen in higher dimensions. And, and since actual solids are higher dimensional, um, even when they're approximately one dimensional in their dynamics, we should think about when is that a, a good approximation? When would we expect things to become three-dimensional instead of one-dimensional? Uh, so a few of the things we'll hear about, one is that a solid doesn't in general have perfect translation invariance. It has at best some kind of lattice or discrete translational invariance. And what does that do? Um, we know that electrons are charged so we can modify them in ways that we couldn't really ordinary water, like adding a magnetic field, which is good for Tallahassee and so on. And then uh, the one I'm going to focus on is a way that dynamics in solids tends to be modified, uh, especially in magnetic materials or in magnetic fields, but, uh, it, but in general, in principle, um, which is through the Berry phase. Um, and that's really the first part of the talk, because that's maybe the biggest, uh, I'd say, interesting difference about being in the solid background compared to being in the continuum. Um, and then another thing we might expect, and where I'm going to close, because it's kind of a frontier, is... Uh, most of this talk will be about cases of dynamics that we can understand in a moderately simple picture. Um, but when we go to new kinds of particles where the electron breaks up or the spin breaks up into some smaller fractional particle, uh, 
um, we know that happens in various kinds of topological phases, then what new dynamics might those have? And that's a surprisingly hard problem to, to predict either numerically or analytically, um, but I'll, I'll talk about some surprising new directions of that that are emerging. Okay, so a way to sort of organize different things you're hearing about, uh, if I'm just thinking about electron dynamics or dynamics in general, um, diffusion is what I call the standard model. It's how electrons usually move around. It's what gives you a finite conductivity and things like that. Um, but you've already heard about several uh, exceptions. One is fluid-like behavior, like in the Navier-Stokes equation, for example, where you don't get diffusion. In general, you get convection. Um, things tend to move around generally more rapidly than diffusion would predict. Uh, at least, you know, that's why your room tends to heat up more rapidly than if it were just uh, heat solving a diffusion equation like in a solid. Uh, another possibility, you might have an order parameter that modifies the dynamics. You might have localization, uh, as you heard about yesterday, and you might have ballistic behavior. The simplest case would be free particles, but many integrable systems, um, integrability gives you a kind of modification of ballistic behavior, but from a scaling point of view, it's still ballistic. But there's other stuff out there as well. So a basic question would be, if we focalize, if we focus on electrons and solids, um, when are you going to get uh, these various possibilities? And at least I'm, I'm going to leave out localization, but we'll at least see when you might get diffusion, when you might get fluids, when you might get ballistic behavior, and when you might get some other things. So the standard model, uh, one way to uh, summarize a, a basic tenet of it is to go back to Einstein, who was thinking about Brownian motion. So this part is classical, but it works just as well in quantum systems. Uh, and to explain sort of how we generally calculate things um, in either a classical or quantum theory that are linear responses, um, which means how does a system respond to a small perturbation equilibrium? Uh, there's one very useful idea, um, but it's worth thinking about how this idea might break down. Um, so Einstein was thinking about one heavy particle, like this yellow particle, uh, moving in a, a bath of light particles. Um, and if you had a more than one heavy particle, and if you had a density difference in the heavy particles, you would see a restoring current, uh, according to the basic law of Fick, uh, where a gradient in density, which is one perturbation to equilibrium, because equilibrium would have constant density, uh, a gradient will give you a, a current that responds uh, linearly to the gradient of the density. So if you actually ask what is the magnitude of this diffusion constant, um, it turns out that even though this is a uh, restoration of equilibrium at linear order from a perturbation, it's given by an equilibrium dynamical correlation function of the velocity of the heavy particle. So the way this works, uh, if the heavy particle if you like, remembers its velocity for a long time, it, it loses its velocity only slowly to the bath, then you will get a large diffusion constant. Um, but if it decays rapidly, then you will get a small diffusion constant. So this is maybe the first example of uh, something like a Kubo formula, where you can express a linear response coefficient in terms of a dynamical correlation function equilibrium. So this is how we calculate a lot of things, both classically and quantum mechanically. And, and I guess the philosophical idea could be stated as one way you could perturb a system from equilibrium is to drive it actively, like with a density gradient or an electric field or something. But you could also perturb it just by letting it fluctuate. You know, fluctuations will move it away from equilibrium. Um, and when you have those fluctuations, uh, the way that a system responds to equilibrium doesn't actually care very much about whether you pushed it away or whether it fluctuated away. That's this fluctuation dissipation idea. All right, so moving on, let me give an example of how, you know, for either electrons or spins, how you might measure this in a solid. So ordinary diffusion, uh, let's say we go to high temperature and our only conservation law is density. If we were thinking about energy as well, we might have uh, thermal conductivity, but let's just think about a number of particles to make it as simple as possible. Then a basic fact about the diffusion equation is that it's got a conservation law for the total number of particles. And a solution um, consistent with that conservation law is to start with a lump of particles at the origin and watch it go. And I will get, um, as the lump spreads out, it will follow a Gaussian profile. And I think you've all seen this as a solution of a diffusion equation. So a way to actually observe this, um, getting away from electrons and just focusing on spins, well, there are many magnets where the total spin is conserved. The total spin commutes with the Hamiltonian. Um, and then I might expect some kind of spin diffusion. Uh, 
Um, and then if I were to try to relate it to a spin-spin correlation function, I would again expect a Gaussian profile, and this corresponds to dynamical exponent z equal to two, um, where the dy dynamical exponent means the relationship between length scales and time scales. Um, so diffusion is one possibility that I think you all know, and it's the most common situation in solids. For example, electrons moving through a typical solid at room temperature, they tend to bounce off phonons, they tend to bounce off, uh, let's say, uh, impurities. So they, they lose their momentum rapidly. And again, I could calculate their diffusion constant. Um, but what if I had momentum conservation uh, and energy conservation, as well as number conservation, then that's a standard fluid, something like water. So water, the way things move around is more complex than diffusion because there are three conservation laws. Um, and as you heard in the last lecture, um, by assuming a Boltzmann equation, which is a description of a, a different quantity, the one particle distribution function, um, you can actually derive these hydrodynamical equations. And the basic idea is that even if the one particle distribution function starts off as something very complicated, uh, it rapidly gets reduced to a local equilibrium form where only three bits of information survive locally, um, three pieces of information, I shouldn't say bit, uh, where one is the number density, one is the momentum density, or here it's written as velocity u, and one is the energy density here written as tau. Um, so then for many longer time scales, uh, I can use this simplified description of the fluid equations. So for example, in air, it takes only a few collision times to set up local equilibrium, and then it takes many, many, uh, I can use the hydrodynamical equations for many orders of magnitude, something like eight, um, and then global equilibrium might get established. But there's a very long region of time scales where uh, hydrodynamical equations are useful. So in a solid, our first guess might be um, if we had a very clean solid and if we could not worry about electron phonon interactions, say, then we might get something like this description that has been uh, possible it was first, I think, successful with some two-dimensional electron systems in the 90s, and it's come back into vogue with very clean two- and three-dimensional materials more recently. Um, but what might be more interesting is how is the electron fluid going to be different from these equations, different from a fluid like water? And there are a couple of ways, and this talk is, uh, the part on electrons is mostly about the ways that electron physics might be different from a standard fluid. Uh, so, Let's uh, forget about, for the moment, I will come back to it, but let's forget about the possibility of additional conservation laws. That's one way, certainly, that the electronic system could be different, as you heard about last lecture. Uh, so even if we don't have too many conservation laws, there is a, a basic effect of the crystal lattice. So one that is well known and is in all the textbooks is uh, in, a, in a lattice, momentum is not perfectly conserved. Um, crystal momentum is conserved, or if you like, momentum up to h bar times a reciprocal lattice vector. And the processes where you change the electron momentum um, by losing some one of those reciprocal lattice vectors, uh, those are called umclaut processes. And that's a well-known example of how uh, you might have to think about even in a very clean solid momentum transfer. I'm going to focus on another, which was really only understood starting in the 90s. And its full consequences for dynamics are a topic of active research. And it's basically one electron physics. So the first half of this talk is going to be largely about independent electrons. Um, but it turns out that it's important, you know, as the starting point, and then you can add interactions on top of it. Um, and that's actually how many interesting states of matter, um, either metallic states or insulating states, turn out to work, um, especially above one dimension. So the focus of this talk for the next half hour, let's say, is going to be on um, clean solids with a crystal lattice, above one dimension. Um, and you might think, well, you know, I took a course on solid state physics, so why am I having to listen to this all over again? Well, there are some ideas that don't usually manage to get covered. And in particular, the relevance of these ideas to dynamical phenomena uh, doesn't appear, at least in most uh, courses on solid state physics, I would say. So that's what I want to focus on. And even if you've heard a few things before, I hope you haven't heard everything before. So what I want to introduce is the dynamical importance of Berry phases in solids um, for maybe two kinds of dynamics in solids. And this is my slide that looks ahead. So you'll understand some of the things on the slide in 20 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to define a couple of gauge fields that live in the Brillouin zone of any crystal. And those gauge fields, it turns out that 
after 40 years of working, and this was a large part of Dallas's Nobel Prize, uh, people now understand that almost every gauge invariant object you can move out, you can make out of these gauge fields has a physical meaning, um, either in insulators or in metals. So in insulators, this was Thalys's way of understanding the quantum Hall effect. Um, and it turns out also to be a useful way to understand other insulating phases like topological insulators and so on, and even to understand things like polarization and so on. And I think the last time I talked at one of these magnet lab schools, it was of order 10 years ago and I talked about insulators, um, maybe fewer than 10 years ago, but it was a few years ago. Um, what I'm gonna focus on now are dynamics and metals. And it turns out, in other words, that Berry phases are important for two kinds of dynamics. One you could call adiabatic dynamics. It's what we're used to in insulating phases. And the other is sort of ordinary metallic dynamics. Um, but because of Berry phases, you get some new things. Uh, you also understand some old things. So let me say what this Berry phase is. And I'll go fairly quickly because this is in review articles and uh, I'll spend more time on the new parts. Um, but do go ahead and interrupt me, and I'll try to say more or point you to a reference if you have a question. So uh, the beginning of the sort of topological phases of matter, uh, you, you might date to 1980 or so when people discovered the integer quantum Hall effect. And the idea was, if you take electrons that are moving in a material that's two-dimensional and in a strong magnetic field, something quite unexpected happens. So if you focus on the red curve, which is rho xy, in other words, uh, you're running a current along one direction and measuring the voltage that builds up transverse to it, then normally you do that and you see a straight line dependence with magnetic field, which is what you see at small fields here. And that straight line tells you how many carriers you are, you have and whether they're electrons or holes. So it's a pretty useful characterization experiment. Now, as you go up to stronger magnetic fields, you see these plateaus. It's almost as if the number of electrons or holes is quantized. Um, and if you convert you know, this plateau to a conductivity value, um, it looks like the conductivity is an integer times e squared over h. And that uh, e squared over h, that's just fundamental constants. It doesn't care in principle what solid you're in. It's the electron charge and Planck's constant. And that's one way to understand this is in terms of the Berry phases. But maybe the, the big point to make is just because you're in a solid background um, doesn't mean that things are messy. In fact, this is such a precise experiment that was recently used to redefine the volt. Um, so a big chunk of material with defects and thermal fluctuations and so on, um, sometimes things turn out to be surprisingly good. So that's uh, maybe an optimistic picture for what we'd like to accomplish with the dynamical properties I'm going to focus on. The dynamics going on in this kind of experiment, one reason they can be so precisely quantized is that they're basically adiabatic. Um, it's like the ground state is evolving. There aren't really excitations. So when we go to systems where dynamics are, are more typical, where we're talking about dynamics of excitations and things like that, we don't expect to get such precise quantization, but we now understand at least a few examples where we can get some degree of quantization, even in a metal. That's one of the new things I want to talk about. All right. So when I say wave function topology causes this, uh, let me quickly give the Thalys at all picture of, of where the integer Hall effect comes from, which uh, it wasn't really the first picture. Um, I would say Laughlin's pumping picture was the first. Uh, but what Thalys and collaborators set out to explain was, if I just sit down and don't think about a new kind of transport like Laughlin did, if I just want to think about standard conductivity calculations, um, can I see why I get these plateaus? You know, Because it, it's not the way conductivities normally look. So if I don't know the answer beforehand, if I just use that same Kubo formula I wrote down earlier, um, what will I get? And the ingredient that turns out to be the right way to express the answer um, goes back, it, it actually was happening at the same time, the sort of general understanding by Berry. There were examples before, but Berry kind of unified it. And Barry's point, you could state, at least the example that he worked out in most detail, was um, that the adiabatic theorem of quantum mechanics is only half of the story. So the adiabatic theorem is that if you've got a non-degenerate state and you change the Hamiltonian slowly in time, um, you'll remain in that state, which is true, uh, as long as you know, the gap remains to, that, to other states. But the rest of the story is that if you were to take the Hamiltonian around a closed path in parameter space, um, there's one kind of phase you build up related to energies, but there's another piece, which is a so-called geometric phase. It doesn't care how rapidly you move around the path and parameter space. 
Um, and I can write it as something like the integral of a vector potential that lives in parameter space. And for us, we aren't gonna be talking about adiabatic evolution, but it is going to be the same mathematical object. There is a vector potential that lives in momentum space for us, and it's going to be made out of the block wave functions in this way. So let me try to convince you that this is a, a reasonable way to write something and that it could be physically meaningful, at least if we, if we make the right integrals or right derivatives. Uh, so the idea is at every point in parameter space, let's say there's a single non-degenerate wave function for now. Um, and I want to know, uh, can I make something out of that wave function that might tell me uh, physics that is missing in the things I normally calculate? And the way to understand why it has this form is if I've got a single non-degenerate state at one point in parameter space, then you and I have to agree on many things, but we might disagree on the overall phase. Everything else is sort of set, but uh, the overall phase we know is ambiguous or not directly observable. So let's say I choose one phase and you choose another. Then this Berry vector potential uh, or Berry connection A has the nice property that under a change of phase, it changes exactly like the vector potential in electrodynamics. It picks up a gradient. And that's a clue as to what might be physical. So I, I said before that um, not everything involving A and F is necessarily physical, but every gauge invariant object is. Gauge invariant means it doesn't care about phase choices like this. And we know that the simplest way to make something that doesn't care about a gauge choice in electrodynamics is to take the curl of A and get the field strength tensor, the electric and magnetic fields, well, in a solid, we're going to take the curl of A, which gives us the so-called Berry curvature. And the Berry curvature was the first and still maybe the most important of the objects made out of the, the Berry phase in solids. Um, and there is a non-abelian generalization of, of all of this, which turns out to be important for the magnetoelectric effect and some other things. And that's just saying, if I've got multiple bands coming together, or maybe even if they don't come together exactly in energy, if they're all occupied, then sometimes the energy difference doesn't matter then I can make a connection where I've got band indices, alpha and beta, um, and that will behave just like a connection in quantum chromodynamics or some kind of non-abelian theory, a UN connection to be precise. Well, most of what I'm going to talk about is just a U1 connection, uh, U1 meaning unitary group with one element, um, like in ordinary electrodynamics. All right, so now you know that's kind of an interesting mathematical object. Uh, what does it have to do with solids? Uh, well, let me go ahead and make the Berry connection and Berry curvature out of the Bloch wave functions in the Brillouin zone and ask, uh, do these affect any physical quantities? Well, the quantity in parentheses here is just F in the, the second line from the bottom. And the point of this equation is that if I integrate F over the Brillouin zone, and let's think about a two-dimensional crystal, um, this is where the magic happens. It turns out that that's a mathematical object called a churn number. Um, sometimes in this context, it's called a TKNN integer after the paper by Dallas and collaborators. And that integer has a physical meaning. So it's a topological invariant like a winding number, but it's physical consequences. It tells me if I fill up a band with electrons, um, how many, uh, how much do those electrons contribute to the quantum Hall effect? So this is how you can get a conductivity in an insulator. Um, that is sort of in the right units and integer is that you wind up starting with the Kubo formula, being able to massage away the energies and things like that, and just being left with this purely geometric object. And the way transport works, I'm not gonna go through, it's a kind of pumping adiabatic process. It's not the sort of thing I want to talk about today, um, but it turns out that even other dynamical processes like what happened in metals involve this same object and other objects made out of F and A. Um, so that is what I wanna focus on. All right, so I'm gonna now skip over, you know, many nice developments in the area of insulators uh, and talk about metals. Um, because actually the, the, I think the, the most basic appearance of the Berry phase in solids is not what Thaulis did. It's actually what um, some people were talking about even earlier, Karplus and Luttinger, but they weren't really understood or accepted by the community for a, a variety of reasons. But one was that the Berry phase was not well understood. Um, but now we do understand some things a little bit better than when Karplus and Luttinger were working back in the 60s. Um, and we even understand maybe physical consequences. So they were right about what they were doing and they were right about what experiment it would be important for. Um, but now we have additional understanding and examples. Um, so what motivated them 
Well, let me, look, let me first give, you know, why does the berry phase matter in metals and other things? And then I'll come back to what Karplus and Luttinger and people going back to Hall of the Hall effect were trying to do. The basic idea is um, where the berry phase matters, it tends to give information about the spatial structure of wave functions. And the easiest way to see that is, suppose I don't want to work with F, if I just wanted to work with A, maybe the most basic thing, the Berry connection, I told you the Berry connection at one point is not going to be physical because it depends on a choice of gauge. But if I make a, a loop integral of A through the Brillouin zone, I can get something that is um, almost unambiguous. It has a little bit of ambiguity, but it turns out that it's a quantized ambiguity and it's, it's the right ambiguity. I get electrical polarization. And this top line is called the modern theory of polarization. It was worked out by people like Dallas Vanderbilt, uh, Resta, King Smith, and so on. Um, and the point is that the polarization is the loop integral of A. And that's interesting because electric polarization as a property of solids, people had struggled with for about 50 years before realizing that it was a berry phase property. Um, and the polarization, we know that the electric polarization of a solid changes when the electrons move. Um, elect polarization is like, you could view it as either bulk dipole moment or surface charge. Uh, but what this suggests, this fact about insulators that the polarization is a berry phase, is that maybe the berry phase matters for things that have to do with where the electrons are located, because the, that's not very obvious in, say, the band structure E of K. Um, and, and here's a reason why for optical properties and other things, um, like polarization also, um, the berry phase almost had to be important. So uh, I'll tell you a fact about symmetry that you can work out for yourself if you like. Um, if you think about a material that breaks inversion symmetry, so it doesn't have a center of inversion, and at first glance you might think k is not equal to minus k, um, but if it has time reversal symmetry, then if you just stare at the band structure, it will still look symmetric between k and minus k. So for example, gallium arsenide breaks inversion, but you wouldn't really know that just looking at E of k. Um, and that's because basically time reversal is enough to guarantee that the energy at k is equal to the energy at minus k. So that means if you want to know, you know what physical quantity of the solid is going to determine observables that depend on inversion breaking, which is both polarization and many optical properties like second harmonic generation, then you need some additional information about the wave function that's not there in E of K um, at low energy. So at high energy, that's often things like matrix elements for optical transitions. At low energy, um, it's usually the Berry phase or else it's one other object that will appear later on. Um, but the Berry phase is the most frequently occurring one. So it's an object made from the wave functions that is sensitive to inversion breaking. Uh, so the way that matters for solids, and I'll draw a picture for you in a second, uh, is what Karplus and Luttinger were talking about, which is that there has to be a term missing in many solids from the standard dynamical equation that you're used to um, in books like Ashcroft and Merman say, in older books at least. So the, the first term on the right-hand side is one you've all seen before. Even that has a kind of modern modification that, that I'll come to. But if I just look at it as written, it's the group velocity, the fact that I'm in a band structure, the velocity of the electron is modified. All right, the second term is the one that maybe is a bit more subtle. And this is the same F I talked about before. It's the Berry curvature. The idea is if the momentum of the electron is changing, say, because I applied an electric field or something like that, then there might be an extra piece of the velocity. And I'll draw a picture in a second, but here's why this is there in words. We know that the group velocity, that's like the electron is a point. It doesn't have any interesting dependence on structure of the electron wave function. Okay, the right term is the following idea that we know that the wave function of the electron changes as momentum changes. And it could be that it, at one momentum, the electron is sitting on atom A, which is on one part of the unit cell. And then at a different momentum, the electron wave function is sitting somewhere else. Then if the electron momentum is changing smoothly, the electron is moving within the unit cell, if you like. The fact that the electronic wave function is not constant with K, could give me a velocity. Um, and that Berry phase is what sort of measures that. And that's why it's related to pumping transport, but it's also why pretty much any kind of metallic transport is modified if you have these Berry phases, which you will have in general if you break either inversion or time reversal or both, of course. So the way this was originally realized was in thinking about uh, what Hall actually measured back around 1890 or so, which is magnetic metals like iron. Um, and this is indeed important for that. 
but what we now realize is that it's also important and maybe even more uh, essential for some optical properties. And in particular, um, the main new result I want to build up, we now understand a couple of examples where because of the berry phase, you can actually get something quantized in a semi-metal, in some newly discovered semi-metals. You can even get something quantized in, in graphene. Uh, that's kind of an older result. So I want to maybe start with the usual dynamical properties and then get to optical properties, a kind of dynamics at high frequency. So this is my uh, picture of, of what I said in words that, you know, I'm going to have different block wave functions at different, uh, or yeah, the, the periodic part at different values of the momentum. And those might be located in different parts of the unit cell. So there must be some contribution to the velocity from the electron moving within a unit cell. And that means that when I come to interactions and fluids and so on, all of those things are going to be modified in crystals that break inversion symmetry or break time. So that's sort of the, the, the general point. It's not limited to one electron, but you can understand it at one electron. So the anomalous Hall effect, um, this is saying if I measure the Hall effect sigma xy in a magnetic material, um, then there will be, uh, and sigma xy can already be there because the material breaks time reversal by itself. Um, you could think of it as the material has a sigma xy because of its own magnetic field, but it turns out that that's not the heart of the story, usually. Um, the dominant effect is that time reversal breaking, the magnetic order has modified the band structure and introduced a berry phase. Um, and uh, you know, as a proof of principle, you can have an antiferromagnet where the overall magnetic moment is zero, but if it's a non-collinear antiferromagnet, those will usually have a sigma xy. So in other words, it's not really from the field of the antiferromagnet because there is no constant field. Um, it's more from various other things. Uh, so there are things that you can understand in sort of standard Fermi surface transport, um, where I've got electrons bouncing off impurities, we usually call those extrinsic contributions. But there's another piece, uh, which is from just the same integral that mattered in the quantum Hall effect, except that now I don't extend that integral over the whole Brillouin zone torus, I only integrate over the Fermi C. And that turns out to matter uh, in a region which is not the easiest one to do controlled calculations in, which is why it took a long time for this to be accepted. This picture is from a very nice scholarly review article. Um, but if I look at conductivities where it's not so clean that it's dominated by the Fermi surface, but it's not so dirty that it's dominated by hopping, um, then there's a region of several orders of magnitude where this does seem to be the dominant contribution. Um, but then you could ask, well, what about, you know, what if I want something that's there in the clean limit and uh, the dominant contribution in the clean limit and also maybe quantized? Because in an ordinary metal, uh, things that depend on the integrating out to the Fermi surface are usually not going to be quantized because if I move the Fermi surface a bit, then I'll just move my domain of integration and I would expect to get additional contributions. Um, so indeed, the anomalous Hall effect has a contribution from the Berry phase, but it's not a quantized contribution. So let me mention some work from 10 years ago, because it's going to be the same optical effect in the more recent work. Um, but we were originally interested in it 10 years ago as a simple example where the Berry phase contributes um, and, and maybe the explanation for some old experiments. So the idea was uh, the circular photogalvanic effect or chiral photocurrent is the following effect in light. Um, you just apply light and you measure the current that you create but you measure the part of the current that cares about whether the light you applied was right circular or left circular. In other words, right circular light, let's say produces a current one way, left circular produces a current the other way, and you look at the strength of that difference. So the easiest way to understand why this is a berry phase effect is to focus on low frequency, which is what we did in 2010. And there, um, the idea is, if I'm thinking about just sort of semi-classical transport in a metal, the electric field might push the electrons away from the ground state, which is the black circle, to the gray circle. So I've just shifted over the electron distribution and how much I shift depends on relaxation time and so on. Um, but now if I've got circularly polarized light at low frequency, the gray circle will rotate around the black circle and the ordinary velocity will average to zero. But if you have a crystal that breaks inversion symmetry, it turns out that the anomalous velocity does not average to zero. Um, but the anomalous velocity contribution will flip if you go from right circular to left circular uh, polarization. So this is uh, just simple semi-classical calculation saying that 
this chiral photocurrent or circular photogalvanic effect has the right symmetries to be controlled by the Berry phase and at low frequencies, uh, it is dominated by the Berry phase. But again, it's like that other case I talked about, it's not particularly quantized or anything like that, we thought in 2010. Um, but that was because there were some new materials that had to be discovered in the meantime. So those new materials, um, I don't know if they've come up yet uh, because they were first understood in terms of band structure, not dynamics. But the idea is uh, we now have two kinds of three-dimensional materials that are sort of different generalizations of graphene. And they're actually different versions of the Dirac equation from the early days of quantum mechanics. So graphene, you've probably heard, has two-dimensional electrons um, and it's a semi-metal where the Fermi surface is just two points in the Brill one zone. So what about three dimensions? It took longer to find three dimensional examples, but now we have them. These are materials where um, the Fermi surface in 3D is just a couple of points, uh, maybe as many as 24 in tantalum arsenide. Um, and there's linear dispersion near those points. And the difference between the two kinds of semi-metals in 3D, let me quickly try to explain that. So the Dirac equation that Dirac was talking about was a four by four matrix equation. And in our language, that would be a four band semi-metal where uh, four bands come together at a point. So a vial semi-metal, well, soon after Dirac's equation, uh, two people figured out two different ways to take half of the Dirac equation. Um, one was vial and one was Majorana. So Majorana said you could have a particle that is its own antiparticle instead of being different, like the electron and the positron are different. What vial said was if we had massless particles, then something interesting happens in the Dirac equation. Um, with massless particles, they can have a helicity that is independent of reference frame. So like a fixed particle, a fixed property of the particle. If I've got a, a right-handed helicity, say the uh, spin is along the direction of motion, then that is not going to change because I can never catch up with the, I can never go to a frame that is moving faster than the particle and flip its helicity basically. So Val's point was in mathematical terms that for massless particles, you can decouple the Dirac equation into left-handed and right-handed pieces. Um, so we thought for a long time that maybe the neutrino would be a val fermion. It would be massless and have a definite handedness, but um, it's not in our world. Uh, sometimes high energy physicists will say if we lived in a, you know, in a better world without all the symmetry breaking at low energy, then things are fundamentally val fermions, but in, in the observable low energy world, they're not. Um, but they do exist for electrons and solids. Um, and there was a, a open question for a number of years. I mean, we, we've now found several answers, but um, what are interesting consequences of having these uh, Val points or Dirac points in the band structure of a three-dimensional material? And I want to focus on how that is an example where the Berry phase gives you something new in dynamics. So uh, this has been a long-standing quest, but it, it did get some uh, impetus from topological ideas. So one was the realization that a vowel point, which is a two band crossing, has a kind of quantized Berry phase. If I were to make a little sphere around it in the Brillouin zone, I would get a quantized flux of the Berry phase through or the Berry flux through that sphere. Um, so in other words, a vowel point is like a magnetic monopole of Berry flux. So uh, what does that do for us? Well, one prediction from that uh, made in this paper I mentioned was that there should be an unusual surface state. So a 3D topological insulator, if you've heard of that, has a surface state which is like half of a normal metal. It's got an odd number of Fermi surface sheets. Um, the surface of a vial semi-metal can be half of a normal metal in a different way. Instead of having a closed Fermi surface, you have something like a Fermi arc. You've got, say, one half of the Fermi surface on top and it only gets closed on the bottom of the sample. So that's a, a neat band structure consequence that you can look for. But you could ask, you know, what, what are bulk consequences of these vowel points? Uh, and it turns out that they provide an example of optical properties being quantized due to the Berry phase. Um, and there's even an older example of optical quantization in metals. And this is maybe saying, I guess, why I think uh, going to finite frequency maybe reveals some interesting things about solids that we don't always uh, think about, um, which I didn't realize when I was a grad student, at least. And that is probably the easiest way to measure the, the fine structure constant to within a few percent is to hold a sheet of graphene up to the light. Because it turns out that graphene is mostly transparent. It will let through about 2.3% of the light. Um, and that 2.3% is a magic number. It's pi times one over 137, 
where one over 137 is the vacuum fine structure constant of electromagnetism. So this effect, it, it, you know, it's not very topological in this case, I would say. Um, it just comes from the, the linear spectrum, but it does show that there is something special about semimetals and that we might get, if we look at the right property, um, at least at the one electron level, but in graphene, it's, it holds experimentally even with whatever interactions are actually present in graphene. So this is a true experimental fact. Um, you can get things at non-zero frequency that are quantized, um, even when in zero magnetic field, there's nothing particularly quantized about the graphene resistivity, I would say. It's at least not as precise as this. So could there be something like this in 3D? Um, and that's going to be the end of my one electron story. Uh, I want to, the answer is basically yes, but to explain uh, why and how it relates a little bit to the quantum Hall effect, um, once it looked like vile semimetals were going to exist in the solid state, people started trying to borrow from the high energy literature. And it was known that one vial point is a very unusual object. And in fact, if we had a crystal that only had one vial point, um, the universe would be broken uh, in the sense that we could use electric and magnetic fields to create charge. Um, one vial point is by itself anomalous in the sense that adding an electric and magnetic field will violate charge conservation. But the good news is whenever we've got a crystal, the total number of vowel points, if I include all momenta and also all energies is zero. I could have positive and negative points at the same energy, or I could have say positive points at one energy and negative points at a different energy, but either way, the total charge has to be zero, but there is still a consequence. And the way to maybe guess what the consequence might be is to think about the quantum Hall effect and do some power counting. So in two dimensions, let's forget about spatial indices for the moment. Um, I can have a current density induced by an electric field just using E and H. If I go up to three dimensions, um, and I'm going to ignore things like uh, dielectric constant and so on, I could hope for uh, one more power of electric field. I would need an extra power of E and H, and that would, by power counting, give me one more inverse length and one more inverse time. So it would become a three-dimensional current density, and it would have to be as a function of time, but at least by power counting, if I don't want to have any material dependent velocities or something like that, then this is a possibility. So people started trying to take over the chiral anomaly and use it to get observable effects. Um, and the first efforts were in linear response and those wind up being challenging and you find that vowel semimetals are actually not, I would say, qualitatively different in linear response. And I'm not gonna go through the details of that history. Um, I'm going to uh, say what the linear response is. It's actually something called optical gyrotropy or natural optical activity. When light passes through a crystal, the, the plane of polarization gets rotated. Um, and the reason why I wanna bring it up, even though it's kind of a, a no-go theorem or negative result is that it's, it indicates one other ingredient that has to be there in the dynamics of electrons in a solid. Um, and that is a modification of the group velocity. Um, so in hindsight, this is maybe obvious, but uh, the idea is if you go into a solid, we know that an electron and an atom has an orbital angular momentum and that couples to magnetic field. Well, the same thing is also true in a solid, except that that coupling, that orbital angular momentum in a sense, uh, or orbital magnetic moment, is going to depend on K. And because it depends on K, I will get gradient effects and those will modify the group velocity. So this additional term turns out to be enough to understand at low frequencies, the linear response, it's a kind of optical rotation. Um, that's why you have to go to nonlinear responses, at least if you don't wanna to go to heat or something like that. Valve semimetals have hugely strong nonlinear optical responses. And to finish up the one electron story, in certain valve semimetals, there is a quantized optical response. If you can put the Fermi level at the right energy, um, and there's even some experimental evidence for this in the last year or so, the basic idea is what I mean by having the Fermi level at the right energy, um, you can do the calculation of that chiral photocurrent for a single vowel point, and the answer gives you a quantized value related to E cubed over H squared, just like that formula I wrote down a moment ago. But you could say, well, how could I ever isolate just one vowel point when I just told you there has to be a total charge of zero? The answer is just to put the Fermi level in the right place and find the right material. So you can have a Fermi level, um, which is this dotted line. Uh, the green electrons are what are filled in the ground state. And if the Fermi level is in between positive and negative points, you'll get optical transitions across one of the points. 
but optical transitions across the other point will be blocked. You'll just get the kind of low frequency stuff we studied in 2010, which we know is weak. So then the big question is what happens at this point? And that's the quantized value. Um, and there is even a little bit of experimental evidence for this. Um, so this is a dynamical property that is strongly modified by being in a particular solid of Alcimdon. But I, I mostly wanted to kind of give it as an example of Berry phase physics. I'm going to skip over the interaction modification because I want to basically you know, call time on one electron and take questions on one electron before going to fluids and interactions. So my claim is when you go into a solid, there are a lot of boring modifications that might expect you to, uh, or maybe not boring, but well understood modifications that might expect you not to see really interesting dynamics. You might expect that the electrons just diffuse because they bounce off phonons or impurities. Um, you might expect that, you know, as a result, the only physics you will see is diffusion. And that may be true at very long time scales, but we know that localization by disorder is one dynamical effect that is well observed. Um, and now we're going to try to think about when could we observe um, things that are, are you know, nearly fluid-like because of interactions in a solid. Uh, but the main modification to the one electron dynamics that you have to put into the Boltzmann equation and therefore into all the kind of collective dynamics, fluids and so on, unless you're dealing with something very simple like graphene is the berry phase. So let me pause. I think, uh, I hope for some people this was new. I saw that uh, Zach from Berkeley is on the call. So he's taken a course from me and probably seen some of this before, but for everyone else, you might not have seen things this particular way. Now's probably a good time to take a breather and see if anyone has any questions on the one electron part before we do fluids and interactions. Otherwise I might ask you a question. There is a question in the chat. Ah. Yes, yeah, so you can get berry phases in all kinds of systems, uh, you know, in chemistry. So they're not, I would say the particular structure of this gauge field on the torus and the things it does. So, so berry phases, I don't claim that berry phases are unique to solids. I guess I mean that they're not there for, um, let's see. Uh, typical fluids in the continuum. So something like uh, the Aronov, if you took a charged fluid in the continuum, you could see things related to the Aronov-Bohm effect, but it's not quite the same kind of berry phase. I guess I would say it's not coming from microscopic wave functions in the same way. So I, I, I would agree with the general point that the berry phase appears you know, anywhere that you've got, I would say, uh, quantum mechanical structures that depend continuously on a parameter. And that could happen in continuum systems. Um, but in solids, the way the dependence on momentum works, uh, I think the idea is that in the continuum, um, it's not natural to have wave functions depend on momentum in a parameter in the same way where momentum is periodic in a solid. It lives on a torus. That's the Brillouin zone. And in a continuum, um, momentum is not periodic in the same way. So you won't get this kind of berry phase. So that's why I'd say that the, the, the way the berry, I, I don't know that um, you can get things like, you know, the quantum Hall effect and so on. I don't think that's possible. Okay, that's not possible in the continuum um, for a number of reasons, but I, I think the, the way that berry phases are gauge fields in the Brillouin zone, as far as I know, is specific to solids because you, you sort of need the Brillouin zone. Uh, yes, that's right. So the quantized value, okay, so I'm, I'm moving on to the next question, sorry. Uh, is the quantized value of CPG related to the chiral charge of valve fermions? It is. Um, and in fact, the material that I showed the data on uh, is rhodium silicide, which has an extra large val charge at, its val, at the val point that was studied. It's actually four instead of one, and that gives you a four times larger signal. So the way to, and yeah, what, one caveat that I kind of rushed through, um, the quantization is never going to be very good. Uh, it, it, if you're lucky, it will be as good as graphene, which is 1%. It's more likely to be 10 or 20% because there are a lot of corrections to it from other bands, from interactions and so on. So it's not protected like an insulators. But it is true that it does basically measure the chiral charge. And if you increase the chiral charge, you will get a larger effect. Um, and the real smoking gun in the experiment that you're measuring the valve points is the fact uh, that when you hit 0.7 EV, that's actually the energy at which it was known in this material before the experiment. Uh, 
um, that's when you start to get optical transitions across the other val point. Um, so in other words, the size of the vertical yellow jump is the frequency. If I were to increase the frequency, I would eventually start to get to unblocked states, states that are not occupied. Um, and those unblocked states, those are the ones where uh, then I'll start to see transitions across the valve point and I'll get contributions from this other one, which would act to cancel out that one. So if I went up to higher and higher frequencies, the effect would turn out to be zero because I'm measuring all the valve points and the total charge of those is zero. So the energy at which that was predicted to happen in rhodium silicide was 0.7 EV. And as you can see, that's when the uh, nonlinear optical effect kind of starts to fall off. So we do believe, and um, if you want, the, the calculation is not that hard. I, I just thought rather than work through it, I would rather get to some interactions and things that are more fluidy. Um, the uh, idea is that the uh, signs of the vowel points are kind of directly measured, I guess, uh, even if the magnitude I think is corrected, you could still take this as a you know, measurement of when, whether you've got positive and negative valve points at different energies. So the linear response, I, I should clarify, it's not zero, but it's also there in other materials. So the point is, if I take a material that is a chiral valve semimetal and I measure its linear optical response, what I claim is that it won't be very different from something like selenium, um, which is not, which is a, a metal that is chiral, semimetal that is chiral, but it's not topological in the same way. And the point is uh, that any uh, low symmetry metal, whether it's a vial semi-metal or not, will have uh, this effect because it will have an orbital magnetic moment. And then if I go back here, the point of this formula at the bottom, and uh, let me mention that we have our own uh, derivation and take on this formula, but there are others as well. Um, this formula says that the linear optical response at low frequency in a chiral metal is given by the integral of the orbital moment over the Fermi surface. And that orbital moment is there, whether it's a vial semi-metal or not. So I guess my claim is, um, it depends on what you're looking for. If you're just looking for a linear response, then it is given by the orbital moment, which is a neat fact that you know could have been known a long time ago because the idea that there were optical rotations was known a long time ago, but people never really understood, I guess, the low frequency origin. It is the orbital magnetic moment. Um, I, I guess that means that all the simpler responses that could be there, like to the electric field, average to zero. Uh, but that response is not something that's very different in vowel semimetals from anything else. Um, it's not particularly quantized or large or whatever. It involves the velocity of the vowel point, for example. So if you want something that is very, my claim is that if you want something that is very unique to vowel semimetals, then you should go to nonlinear. Great, so those are some very good questions. Um, if there are others, I'm happy to take them. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, so that's a very important open question that just appeared in the chat. Uh, interesting, yes. Um, I don't know about quantized. Uh, I don't know other examples of an E cubed over H squared, but there is one that just came out um, that I would say yeah, it's different from the ones I talked about, but it, there's a neat paper by Charlie Kane and there's a non-technical summary of it by Carlo Binacher in the Condensed Matter Journal Club. And what that is about is a, a kind of nonlinear measurement on two-dimensional metals that will measure the Euler characteristic of the Fermi surface. Uh, so it, it's different from the kind of topological properties that we've normally measured. It's not like a, a winding number of wave functions or something. It's almost a more basic property. Um, so that's one thing I can point to that is a feature of a band structure that seems to lead to an interesting nonlinear transport response. Um, but that just came out a few months ago. So I guess I think the main answer to your question is uh, it, that's yeah for all of you to figure out what are additional cases where um, something about band structure could lead us. Yeah, I, I guess maybe a way to look at going back to Thales, uh, you know, the one electron theory of, of solids, you, you might well have thought was pretty much done around 1980, but then it turns out that there are all these geometrical properties and so on. Um, and we, we keep finding new consequences of those. So I don't think it's done yet. And then, yeah, there are nodal line semimetals that have probably some interesting consequences. There's a lot of band structure out there, um, enormous progress on like topological classification of band structure and translating that to responses is kind of an ongoing activity. Um, good. All right, so maybe I'm not seeing any other active questions, so, but thanks for those and let me move on. Um, so I wanted to say a little bit about uh, 
first of all, in general, you know, suppose I hand you a chunk of material and I tell you it's very clean, maybe, when would you expect it to behave like a fluid? Um, and then uh, I will say a little bit on one dimension and how even in solids, there's kind of a, uh, another kind of experiment you can do to see the sort of thing that uh, Fabian Essler was talking about. Um, and, and then maybe talk about how in, in some one dimensional metals, you can see stuff, uh, even if they're not integrable, that is interesting. So um, I put Tomas picture because I wound up working with him on this and he doesn't appear in my acknowledgement pictures at the end, but uh, the basic idea is if we had a very clean solid, it's been known for a long time um, as a theoretical possibility since the 60s and as an experimental possibility since the 90s that momentum relaxation might take a long time. Um, in particular, if momentum relaxation takes a long time compared to the time for electron-electron collisions that don't relax momentum, in other words, for non-umclap electron-electron collisions, that's when we would expect to look for fluid mechanics. Uh, so in general, we want interactions for, for Otherwise, we would just get like ballistic behavior, um, but we uh, we don't want other we, we want the electrons to bounce off each other, but not off other things. Uh, so here's maybe the original idea of Gurji, which was um, to think about a couple of different length scales in a solid. Uh, one is there's some length scale over which I lose momentum from the electron system, but then there's a different uh, scale which can be very short for electrons to bounce off each other. So in other words, if you think about electron-electron collisions in a typical metal, they might be, especially at high temperature, they're happening all the time because there's a very high density of electrons and the interaction between electrons is very strong. Um, we tend not to think very much about electron-electron collisions because most of them conserve momentum. Uh, they're, they're relatively few umclap ones. And the ones that conserve momentum, those will not modify the electron current very much. At least if the electron current is proportional to momentum, they wouldn't modify the electron current at all. Um, so in other, in other words, to modify the, the current directly, I might think I need to bounce off something. So that's why we usually think about phonons or impurities, but not about electron-electron collisions. So we would expect, if I think about, say, electrons running through a wire, which is a bit like a pipe in fluid mechanics, um, the usual limit we're in is that momentum relaxation is uh, is happening, um, you know, it's small compared to the lengths that we measure on. And maybe it's even the shortest length scale if I've got a lot of impurities or a lot of uh, phonons. And then I will get sort of Ohm's law and things like that. Um, where I might expect modifications and things like viscosity to matter is if the momentum conserving length is short, which means the electrons have had time to interact with each other and reach an equilibrium, but it's an equilibrium where momentum is still a conserved quantity. Um, so if that's short compared to say the length scales and the momentum relaxation scale, then I would expect to see things like a fluid flow of electrons through a pipe. Um, and I think the first experiment, as far as I know, this is what uh, Lawrence Mollenkamp was doing before topological insulators, I guess, uh, was to make very clean two-dimensional electron gases and look for evidence that the electron was flowing like a fluid. So one thing that's new on the experimental side is clean enough three-dimensional materials to try to get into this limit. But it turns out that it's hard in ordinary metals. You still want to be in things like semi-metals and graphene is probably the best in this area. And the reason is, uh, let me just try to explain it in words. The Fermi surface um, and the stability of the Fermi liquid are actually not that helpful for hydrodynamics. If you remember Landau's picture for why the Fermi liquid is stable, it was that if you go to temperature much less than E Fermi, um, which is easy in a metal, hard in a semi-metal, maybe. Um, in, so in a metal, if temperature is much less than E Fermi, which room temperature is in a good metal, then there's very little room for electron-electron collisions, which means there aren't enough collisions maybe to destabilize the Fermi liquid uh, or interactions. But it also means there might not be enough collisions to even give me fluid behavior, and I might just get ballistic behavior. So it's true that in, in very clean metals, and Andy McKenzie, again, has worked on this. He's the person I got this figure from. Uh, in very clean metals, you often have something like diffusive behavior at high temperature crossing over rapidly to ballistic or free behavior at low temperature, and there isn't much of a hydrodynamical regime in between. While in graphene and in three-dimensional semi-metals, you could hope for more of a hydrodynamical regime because you don't get that Fermi surface protection from scattering as quickly. Um, but maybe, as I mentioned, what I wanted to focus on are cases where the electron fluid is different from water, 
And here's one example where it's at least different from a, a neutral fluid. Uh, you could see something like this in a charged classical fluid. Um, the basic idea is viscosity is, is one of the classic fluid properties. It says that if you've got a shear flow, um, like in the bottom left picture, then there will tend to be dissipative effects that equilibrate, that, that get rid of that flow. Um, however, uh, and uh, yeah, there, there are various more exotic examples of uh, fluid like stuff at the top. Um, one moderately exotic example is if I break time reversal, there's another kind of term allowed in the viscosity tensor. And with electrons, this was originally understood for topological phases maybe, but it's also there for Fermi liquids and other things. And it's a kind of dissipationless viscosity. So the relation between ordinary viscosity on the left and so-called Hall viscosity on the right is very much like the relationship between sigma XX and sigma XY. So sigma XY uh, requires breaking time reversal. Um, here, the way that shows up, the Hall viscosity is that I've got a shear flow and there's a momentum, just like with ordinary viscosity, that, that flows as a result. But instead of being uh, in the direction that would eliminate the shear flow, it's actually perpendicular. And there's a sense in which this Hall viscosity can actually be quantized in topological states. Um, it's never been measured there, but you can hope to measure it in, in metals at least. So this Hall viscosity tensor, you can calculate it and look for it. Um, the way it actually shows up is in the Q squared correction to sigma xy. So sigma xy at order zero is things like the Hall effect at order Q squared. It's things like the Hall viscosity. If you're wondering about order Q, order Q is actually a different sort of thing. It's that optical rotation effect I talked about earlier, the one governed by the orbital magnetic moment. Um, but in general, the Hall viscosity is not quantized. It's just some interesting fluid-like property that will be there in magnetic metals or if you apply a magnetic field to ordinary metals. Um, so that's, that's one kind of thing that people are actively looking for. I think the Hall viscosity is probably seen in graphene. Um, I'm not sure about other things. And then maybe to close on, on the higher dimensional story for now, um, I just told you earlier on that the Berry phase is one kind of effect that will modify uh, dynamics in metals. And therefore it should be that it will contribute to properties like the Hall viscosity. And that's something we worked on. It turns out that there are other properties that contribute as well. So the, the Berry phase and the orbital moment are already not the whole story. There's something called the quantum metric that matters as well. Um, and various people, including us, have worked a lot on uh, what are some of these other wave function properties that appear in fluid properties and solids. Um, so that, that's what I wanted to say about electrons. Um, I now want to talk about spins. And there's a reason why, if you want to do hydrodynamics, um, there are some advantages to working with spins rather than electrons. And the big one is uh, the electron interaction is fundamentally the Coulomb interaction. If you have a good metal, you might hope for some screening. Um, but if you don't have screening, that's a problem because the Coulomb interaction is intrinsically long range. And that means that some of the assumptions we technically make in fluid dynamics um, are, are harder to justify. I, this, there was a good discussion on this in the previous lecture, for those of you who were there, that um, you might worry about whether Coulomb fluids are really fluids or should be thought more of in terms of plasma physics and things like that. Um, spins definitely have local interactions um, the most non-local piece would be the dipole. The dipole is a lot, it falls off more rapidly than Coulomb, of course, and even the dipole interaction is usually quite a bit smaller than the, the nearest neighbor, say Heisenberg or exchange-driven interactions in solids. Um, so I want to focus on, to start, uh, one example where you can actually use a solid state experiment to see something like the generalized hydrodynamics that was in the previous talk, um, actually at a particular point where it's um, somewhat interesting and challenging. For example, this point was only understood starting in 2019 or so, I would say. Um, and it's the Heisenberg point, which in some ways is the, the most symmetric, the isotropic point of the antiferromagnetic spin chain. Um, so that ground state was solved by Hans Bethe uh, as a graduate student. And how to generalize his solution for the ground state to thermodynamics was only understood about 40 years later. Uh, by Yang and Yang and Lieb and Linegar and other people developed the so-called thermodynamic beta ansatz. So dynamical questions remained hard, but the big breakthrough in the Heisenberg chain and related things um, was another 40 years after the thermodynamics, um, people realized, and this was originally uh, Tomas Prozen, that half of the conserved quantities in a sense had been missed. And those conserved quantities don't matter for thermodynamics, but they are the ones that are most important for dynamics, at least for spin dynamics. 
Um, and then at the Heisenberg point, something special happens and it winds up being different from uh, maybe the standard picture of generalized hydrodynamics and integral models. So I'm going to assume that you were at the last lecture and mostly focus on um, how a particular spin system, the Heisenberg spin chain might show something else. Um, actually, we, there is no derivation of this yet at the same level of accuracy as the derivations you heard about in the last talk. Um, but there is a lot of numerical evidence and even some experimental evidence in the last year or so. So I think I'll focus on that. So the theoretical idea uh, came out of this paper by Lubatinos, Zdarj, and Prozen. Um, and the idea is going to be the following, that if I look at the uh, spin half spin chain, what we sometimes call the X X Z spin chain, where I allow for uniaxial anisotropy in the interactions, then the Heisenberg point is the isotropic point. I could have an easy axis case like the XX chain would be the simplest case where I turn off the SZ, SZ interaction, or I could have say the Ising model would be if I just had the SZ, SZ interaction. And we kind of have, have guessed for a long time and, and we understood through GHD that the physics is basically ballistic in the easy axis case. It's basically diffusive for spin in the easy, sorry, it's diffusive in the easy axis case. It's ballistic in the easy plane case. Um, and what many smart people thought about for a long time is what happens at the Heisenberg point. And the answer at the Heisenberg point turns out to be um, really beautiful and unexpected. And it's something in between uh, ballistic and diffusive behavior. So ballistic behavior uh, would be like free particles or even free particles that sort of delay each other. Um, and that would be Z equal to one, uh, dynamical critical exponent Z equal to one because length evolves linearly with time. Um, the, Diffusive behavior, I wrote up some equations for that earlier, that's equal to three halves. Uh, and then there's a possibility in between. Um, and the first suggestion of this was largely numerical. The idea was that spin-spin correlations, the Heisenberg chain will look like a famous universality class, mostly famous from soft condensed matter physics, which is called Kardar Parisi Zheng. And the simplest equation where um, this dynamics appears is like a noisy nonlinear version of the diffusion equation or noisy Berger's equation. The left side is the same diffusion equation I wrote down before. The right hand side is I want to add one nonlinear term. You could think that this might be the leading order nonlinear term. So it's got uh, gradient of h squared. Gradient of h is roughly going to be analogous to spin sz. Um, and then I'm going to add some random driving just to kind of keep it from relaxing to zero. Uh, and then the solutions of this equation are well understood and even mathematically pretty rigorous now. Uh, and there's a scaling function, um, just like in diffusion, except it's not a Gaussian. And the variable that appears uh, is not like uh, the same one in diffusion because the scaling is different. So in other words, um, of all the integrable models, this one is particularly interesting because it has you know, unexpected long time behavior with even a different scaling behavior. So as I mentioned, this is, appears a lot in driven interfaces and even traffic flow and things like that, but it's now believed to appear in the spin half Heisenberg chain. Uh, the way that would show up is very simple. Um, we would expect excitations to move not linearly, which is the red curve and not diffusively, which is the green curve, but somewhere in between, so-called super diffusively with a particular value of the exponent. Um, so this paper came out and uh, we thought it was uh, a really beautiful solution because um, people had sort of argued that it couldn't be diffusive, so it had to be ballistic. And other people had argued that it couldn't be ballistic, so it had to be diffusive. Um, so a good answer is it's neither ballistic nor diffusive. Uh, and we did our own numerics to try to verify it. I think you've already heard, I'm not gonna go through uh, um, what Fabian talked about again, um, except to say that it, it, you can check it very well in the non-isotropic points. You can do numerics and see, for example, that the prediction of hydrodynamics agrees very well with microscopic numerical calculations. This is something we worked a lot on. Um, and then, so the, the kind of point I'm making is, aside from the cases where th there's a simple description in terms of the Boltzmann equation, something is special happening at the isotropic point. Um, and we could look for that actually in experiment. And I, I want to mention this experiment um, as an example of how sometimes, you know, the people had studied this material before, but in kind of the wrong place for hydrodynamics. They'd studied it for what they were looking for, which was the existence of a fractional excitation, a spin on. Uh, but if you look in a different place, you can see something new. Um, so the, the theoretical idea of what to look for, and here's that 
X, X, Z model I was talking about. So I'm going to assume the same interaction for X and Y spins, but add some uh, anisotropy possibly where the Z interaction might be different. Um, so this one model can have diffusive behavior. It can have ballistic behavior and, and this is checked very much. So it's not perfectly ballistic. There is an interaction effect, which is kind of a delay when particles pass through each other. Um, this is the kind of physics that Fabian Nessler was talking about. Um, and you know, those pictures I showed in the previous slides, numerically, we can confirm this very well. It's even easier than the point in the middle, which I'm now going to focus on, which is the super diffusive behaviors. The idea is that any non-zero temperature, if you have an integrable and isotropic model, and there's a lot of work by uh, people like Roman Vasseur and others on understanding uh, you know, how to show at least that Z is equal to three halves. Um, uh, you could ask just how can we see it experimentally? So for the ballistic case, uh, the experiments using atoms showed up. Um, the main experiment I'm gonna talk about is uh, electron one, neutron scattering on a spin chain. Um, but then there's also an atomic experiment even on this KPZ point that just came out by a different atomic group. Um, Emmanuel Bloch and Johannes Zeiher. Uh, so the, the basic idea is that this unusual dynamics of you know, one of the oldest models in condensed matter physics, the Heisenberg chain has just been understood experimentally in the last year or so, so new things do happen. And then if time permits, I'll, I'll go back to electrons for a bit and talk about uh, how does all this relate, if at all, to one dimensional electronic metals and what's called Luttinger liquid physics. Um, and it turns out that it, it doesn't relate that directly, but there is a different mechanism that gives you unusual transport in, in one dimensional Luttinger liquids. Uh, and if time permits, I'll get into a little bit of that, but I, I don't think I'll finish. I'd rather maybe make sure I get through at least some, uh, some more on KPZ. So the experiment I'm going to talk about is on one of the classic one dimensional Heisenberg compounds, potassium copper fluoride. So this is a three dimensional crystal. Until you get down to the very lowest temperatures, uh, it's pretty well described by a one-dimensional spin chain. So in other words, um, there's a strong coupling along the chains. Uh, if you work it out in Kelvin, this is even above room temperature. Um, it, while there's a relatively weak coupling between the chains, but once you get low enough in temperature, you might expect that this weak coupling kicks in. Um, so that's going to give a lower limit on temperature. The good news is this KPZ hydrodynamics, if I just had the spin chain, it's in principle there at infinite temperature. Uh, in a real solid, you know, it'll melt at infinite temperature. And even before you get to them, there'll be a whole lot of phonons around and so on. But maybe the reason for doing the experiment is the question, uh, can a real solid show features of integrable behavior? And in particular, this detailed sort of integrable hydrodynamics of the kind in the last lecture at room temperature, uh, roughly. Um, so the way that this is measured, well, I, I've kind of talked about spin correlation functions in real time and space. Um, but if I take a Fourier transform of that, I get what you actually measure in neutron scattering experiments, um, which are spin dynamical structure factors, S of Q omega. Q is wave vector and omega is frequency. Um, so as I mentioned, this is kind of an old material and there was classic work done on this by people like Stephen Nagler a long time ago. Um, did they you know, on some level miss something? Well, we went and talked to them and tried to convince them to go back and uh, look in a slightly different place on this compound. Uh, so Alan Tennant and, and Steve Nagler were, were good sports. They were willing. Um, so what was seen a long time ago is what I've labeled here called spin-on continuum. And the idea of those experiments was you go to low temperature and high frequency um, and you look and you, you can tell that there is some unusual kind of particle there where it's not an ordinary spin wave. It's not a magnon, which is what you get in higher dimensional magnets. It's something called a spin-on. It's like a spin half excitation instead of a spin one excitation. So the prediction of the KPZ theory was that we will get uh, an unusual scaling law um, if we look at the dynamical structure factor at, at low frequencies. So to progress, we're going to integrate over frequencies. We would love to go down to zero frequencies. So in other words, we're looking in the opposite temperature and frequency limit from where people had looked before. Before it was low temperature, high frequency. Um, we're looking at high temperature, low frequency. There's a limit to how low in frequency you can go because you start to hit the elastic scattering line. I, I doubt any of you is a neutron scatter, but uh, what they tell me is that we shouldn't, you know, you basically get washed out by the um, omega equal to zero, very strong signal once you get below about 0.5 EV. So we're going to integrate over a window of frequencies 0.7 EV up to, sorry, 0.7 MeV up to 
two MeV um, and ask, say at 300 Kelvin or a little bit lower, can we see any signs that it's not diffusive, which is what everyone would expect in a, in a solid um, and maybe not ballistic, but something else. Uh, so this figure, so I, I'm kind of skipping over a lot of what's in the paper. If you want to read more, it's, it's out in nature physics now. Um, the point of the left curve is to compare what's actually measured with a state-of-the-art numerical simulation using matrix product states on the Heisenberg chain. So if you like, the left side is testing how noisy is the data and over what window in momentum, the horizontal axis, does the frequency integrated structure factor look like it's coming from a spin chain? Um, and the answer is, uh, well, as I said, there's you know, at, at, at small momentum, that would correspond to small frequency. And that's where this cutoff uh, hurts us because we're only integrating over a window starting above some finite frequency. Um, but otherwise, you know, as long as you're not at the very smallest cues, it does look like a Heisenberg chain. And in particular, if now you forget about the numerics and just ask, uh, is there a, a, a region um, and, and over which uh, the data look roughly like uh, are they scaling? Um, well, we can see that there are some uh, signs. You know, there's an exponent that is not exactly minus three halves, which is the theoretical prediction, but it's a lot closer to three halves than it is to uh, one or two, um, which would be the ballistic and diffusive values. So this is what we take as evidence that there is a kind of hydrodynamical regime of spin. So the reason why this is kind of a pleasant surprise about realizing things in solids uh, is that you know we know that at very long times it almost has to be diffusive. This is saying that if you like, it's behaving like a single spin chain without noticing the other chains or the fact that spin is not conserved because of losses to phonons and so on over a long enough time to actually see hydrodynamical behavior. Um, and, and so that, that's why we were uh, excited that the experiment worked, I guess. And then to wrap up, um, I want to maybe motivate what I'm going to talk about next, which is not so much the paper on the screen, but we sort of had a standard picture of how to think about low dimensional spin systems and electron systems, which is something called a Luttinger liquid. It's, it's, the, it's different from a Fermi liquid, which is how you think about metals in D equal to two and D equal to three. The Luttinger liquid is kind of the generic metallic state in 1D, whether or not you have integrability. Um, so how do we connect all the beautiful integrable physics to what happens in the real world where we might have Luttinger liquids, we might have some nice description at low energy, but we know that the actual physics, at, at least at non-zero energies, we expect not to be integrable. So what I mean by stressing the importance of energy, um, the Luttinger liquid is the, the low temperature description of, of solids in one dimension of metals. Um, it is integrable in a sense, the low temperature limit is a free theory but what that means is that there are irrelevant corrections that matter because they break the freeness. Uh, so normally you're trained to believe that irrelevant perturbations don't matter, but there are some perturbations that are called uh, dangerous irrelevant perturbations because they modify the basic picture. And for dynamics, the Luttinger liquid has a lot of dangerous irrelevant perturbations. Um, but first, in fairness, I wanted to show a more recent KPZ experiment um, using atoms that has some experimental advantages because with the solid, uh, the Heisenberg, the, the couplings are basically given to you by the solid. You don't have a lot of flexibility to tune them. Um, with atoms, it's more possible to tune from the isotropic point to other points. And that's what was done in this experiment. Uh, and you can see actually what they measured. If you just focus on this inset of the plot on the left, um, they can see Z equal to three halves uh, when it's isotropic, when they tune away to the easy plane side, which is predicted to be ballistic. There's a bit of an error bar, but it's certainly more consistent with ballistic than with KPZ. And then when they go to two dimensions where we don't expect integrability and therefore we expect diffusion, they seem to see diffusion. Um, so this is a quantum gas microscope experiment where you can kind of follow the evolution in, in real space and time. Um, so that's another, it's kind of a complementary story to the solid state story. I mean, the solid state experiment is much larger length scales and things like that, um, but it's less tunable, I think it's fair to say, than the atomic experiment. So would you expect there to be some ballistic regime, you know, at low temperatures when the correlation becomes very large and locally, the system looks like, you know, it has a single quasi-particle, more or less, you know, 
moving ballistically according to some. That is right. And in fact, that regime lasts longer than we originally expected. So that's actually a, a paper I wasn't going to talk about. It's now, a, it's a PRL by Maxime and me is, and uh, uh, Nick Sherman, that is really about this question. Uh, how do we reconcile? So yeah, you, you, you guessed it. Uh, as you go to low temperature, you have to wait longer for KPZ to kick in, but eventually it always does at the Heisenberg point. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, uh, there's a numerical prefactor. So the, the, the scaling is maybe not so expected. The effective time is like one over temperature for KPZ to kick in, um, but the mm. prefactor is surprisingly small. Uh, mm, okay. So, um, and, and one way to see that even, okay, so, so something that we and other people have been working on for a long time is dynamics of one dimensional metals that are not integrable. Um, and what I thought I would close with is how even those can be interesting. So integrability means you've got these extra conservation laws that live forever. Um, in a generic metal, we, we know that there's a very beautiful one-dimensional limit. And the idea of the Luttinger liquid, if you've never seen that before, is that basically um, in a higher dimensional metal, in a Fermi liquid, the spin and charge move together. The electron is the right quasi-particle and it carries both spin and charge. Um, in one dimension, the electron breaks up and the right excitations are bosons, they're kind of like spin and charge density waves. Um, so for example, there can be a different velocity for spin in 1D metals uh, than there is for charge. So that description as free bosons makes it seem like they would just propagate forever, but we sort of know that if it's not integrable, um, things are probably not going to live forever, at least not at finite temperature, say. Um, so that means there's a balance between the tendency at zero temperature for things to propagate freely and at finite temperature, there should be some relaxation process. Um, and we can actually study how that all happens quite well on a computer and maybe make some predictions for experiments. So um, the basic idea is let's take a simplest possible one-dimensional non-integrable metal, uh, which is going to be to take the XXZ spin chain, which you could Jordan Wigner if you want to fermions with an interaction, uh, spinless fermions, um, and add some additional interactions. Basically, I'm going to add a staggered magnetic field, actually, a magnetic field that alternates between odd and even sites and use that to break the integrability. And something that, okay, so this is just verifying that there is a Luttinger liquid state that you can see it on a computer. I'm going to skip over that. Um, Christoph Karish, who did this, um, did a lot of work, uh, which is quite impressive, to build a one-dimensional generic metal, I would say, on the computer by finding, first of all, um, what you might have been able to guess, uh, was sort of doable from bosonization is over what range of the interactions is the staggered field and irrelevant perturbation. Irrelevant means that if I go to long enough distances, the correlation functions will look like those of the integral model where I don't have the staggered field. But then um, you can actually track the renormalization group trajectory if you like. In other words, find a list of points in the phase diagram of Jz interaction on the horizontal axis and staggered field on the vertical axis, you can find a list of points that all have the same asymptotic physics but differ in the strength of the irrelevant integrability breaking interaction. And the way you can tell that this is having an effect is to look at um, one of the classic signatures whether you've broken integrability, which is whether level statistics are Poissonian, which is what happens in an integrable model, or Wigner Dyson, which means they repel each other. Um, so repelling each other means that if you have one level at a certain energy, you're statistically unlikely to have another level at a very close energy nearby. You can see that's what's happening when I've turned up the integrability breaking. Um, so anyway, so what you can see, and I'm going to go a little bit quickly because I've only got five minutes left. Um, first, in linear response, you can see what you'd expect, um, but had never been seen before, which is that there is a conductivity that diverges at low temperature with a power law that depends on the strength of the interaction. The idea is that um, here, the uh, existence of resistivity is coming from these irrelevant perturbations because the, the relevant part of the action, the only thing that's there at zero temperature doesn't have any scattering, so it's got infinite conductivity. Um, and then as you lower the temperature, you decrease the effect of the irrelevant perturbations and you can see power laws and scaling. So this is showing that the charge conductivity of the fermions or the spin conductivity and the spin representation is blowing up like a power law in temperature. Um, so then we can go back and what we did more recently was to try to see super diffusion in this kind of model where now imagine that you've got the system in the ground state, but you heat up some central region. You throw in some lump of energy to try to see um, 
whether that diffuses in real space. You might say, well, okay, now I'm at finite energy density in that central region, it will diffuse, but the global energy density is zero because you've got a finite amount of energy spreading into an infinite vacuum. This is kind of modeled on atomic experiments, but we actually did it on a spin chain. Um, and as a result, you can indeed see that there's a kind of super diffusion even in a non-integrable model. Um, so it's a bit of a different mechanism from generalized hydrodynamics. And I'm going to skip over the numerical proof because I, I thought it'd be good in my last four minutes to close with a frontier. So we already, we already mentioned one frontier um, in response to uh, the question uh, in the chat, which was uh, understanding more responses, more electrodynamic responses of solids is certainly one frontier. Um, another one is understanding collective physics of fractional particles. So 1D is great. I love one dimension. You can build a lot of neat stuff there. But one thing that happens in higher dimensions is that topological physics gets a lot more interesting. One way it gets interesting is that you get fractional particles. Um, and in particular, spin systems. So I've just claimed that you could get very nice hydrodynamical behavior in spin systems in 1D. Well, spin systems in higher dimensions can have fractional particles. Uh, spin liquids, topological spin states are, are one example. Um, so can we see collective dynamics of fractional particles above 1D? Um, and the answer is, uh, in some cases, yes, but it's very much a frontier. Um, being able to predict, for example, that this is the neutron scattering that you will see, and it will tell you that you've got this particular kind of spin liquid excitation. Um, people work hard on that, and there, is, there, there are some models that we use to compare to experiment, but it's not completely done yet. Uh, so I thought I would close with that. Um, you know, as an example of the kind of problem that is still tough, even for the ground state, um, we don't really know, we don't universally agree at least on what the ground state is of the simple Heisenberg antiferromagnet. If I go from a chain to some two-dimensional lattices like this Kagame lattice, um, there's an even older spin liquid, which is maybe better for the point I want to make, which is that progress is still happening, but um, we might need some new ideas and there are some new ideas. Um, and that's what uh, Anderson was originally talking about, which is actually the triangular lattice, which I'll show in a second. But the idea is the triangular lattice, this particular Hamiltonian, we do know the ground state. I don't think there's any controversy about that. But we know that if you remember sort of where is the physics of where the Heisenberg Hamiltonian comes from, this comes when you're deep in a mod insulating phase. Um, if you get closer to the metal, that is, if you're just on the insulating side of a mod transition, we know that in addition to this nearest neighbor interaction, you get longer distance interactions. You also get multiple spin interactions, like four spin interactions. And those we now understand can drive different kinds of spin liquids. Um, there's one in particular that we worked on, but that's a small piece of a very large field. Um, so when Anderson was talking about the triangular lattice, this wasn't clear, but it was certainly clear by the late 80s that um, if you go, if you take say the Hubbard model deep in the insulating phase on the triangular lattice, you get an ordered state, which is non-collinear, but otherwise pretty simple. Um, the triangular lattice has three sub lattices where say the square sub the square lattice has two. So you get three directions of the spin, sometimes called three sub lattice order, 120 degree state. As you move toward the Mott insulator, um, something that we've been working on for a few years, and I think other people are now maybe starting to see similar things. Um, we believe that there is a gapped phase uh, after the three sub lattice state. So a totally different phase with a gap and with topological order, a chiral spin liquid. Um, so this is where, you know, the dynamical signatures of chiral spin liquids, I don't think I have time to get into, um, but basically all the fractional topological states of spin um, that we now understand as theoretical constructs, we've mostly understood, I think, how to define the phase and what its sort of essential adiabatic or thermodynamic properties are. Um, going beyond that to dynamics are kind of a frontier. Um, and for the triangular lattice, that's something where there is neutron scattering on various compounds and we're trying to understand it. So if you want three possibilities where we would love to distinguish which of these is the actual state in a given material, and we have, say, neutron scattering, but we're kind of at the frontier of being, of, at the moment, I would say, at least I cannot reliably say, this neutron scattering signature tells me I've got a Z2 spin liquid, or a chiral spin liquid, or a gapless spin liquid with either a Dirac point or a Fermi surface of spin-ons. So this, I would say, is one another sort of frontier that I wanted to wrap up with. And in particular, um, if you haven't been exposed to these fractional topological phases of spin, uh, there is a book on topological phases of matter. And this part of the book is actually good. I can say that because it was written by Roderick, not by me. Um, so I'd encourage you, 
if you want to learn about you know fractional topological phases of spin and then start thinking about the dynamics, um, chapter five and six here might be a place to start. All right. Um, one big surprise this year, and I know I'm a minute over, but I'll be. This is, I think, my last slide uh, aside from conclusions and acknowledgments. Um, it turns out that all of a sudden the quantum commuting community got very interested in exactly this kind of problem of given a spin Hamiltonian, uh, some nice, let's say, local Hamiltonian on a lattice without fermions. Um, what are its dynamical properties? Uh, the reason is it, it seems like a problem where, well, first of all, quantum computers are better at dynamics than statics. Uh, it's a problem that is a little bit more robust to noise than something like factoring large integers. Um, and it's something where we can verify, even if we can't verify on classical computers like we could with factoring, we have all this neutron scattering data. So if you had a quantum calculation that gave S of Q omega, um, we would believe it if it agreed pretty well with neutron scattering. Um, so in that sense, we have kind of an experimental or hardware verification. Uh, so that's why this problem has sort of come to the fore. And it's one of the things that is being actively studied in the quantum computing community. Um, you can find papers by you know, nearly a hundred authors or so from Google and Microsoft and so on. And they've successfully realized some fractional topological states of spin, um, the Kataev toric code. Um, that was a state that we understood pretty well. Um, but I think going forward, um, this is one quite surprising direction uh, where people are finding ways to, to maybe make progress on the problems we care about. Of course, there are many other quantum many body problems where quantum hardware will be useful, but this is one kind of dynamics that seems, uh, you know, maybe not in the next year, but in the next five or 10 years, I think there's going to be some progress from this out there direction. All right, so to conclude, uh, I, I wanted to talk about solids. Um, and in solids, there are modifications even at the one particle level. Uh, even in one dimensional metals, um, there are some interesting stuff. Uh, when we go to spin systems, um, then you can start to see, even in a solid, some of the integrable predictions from the previous talk. And in particular, uh, the strong signs of the Cardar Parisi Zhang universality class. In other words, that integrability doesn't just modify uh, the details of ballistic behavior, but it actually gives you different scaling behavior. Um, and in fact, this Heisenberg chain, you know, a, a, another way to state why this was a surprise, the quantum Heisenberg chain has different physics from the classical Heisenberg chain. The classical Heisenberg chain is not integrable. It has diffusion with kind of a log correction, even that log correction is newish work. Uh, but this means that normally we think at high temperature spins are basically like unit vectors, but not for dynamics. For thermodynamics, that is more or less true, but for dynamics, it actually matters that they're still quantum spins and that the quantum Heisenberg chain is much more interesting than the classical Heisenberg chain. And then finally, to, to close with a homework assignment, um, the homework assignment is that we have lots of beautiful fractional topological phases, um, but above one dimension, uh, you know, there are, there are some big successes like understanding neutron features of spin ice and things like that, um, but there's still a lot of open work to do. Uh, and that's an area where I think progress is actively happening. So with that, um, thanks very much for listening and I'm happy to take any more questions. Okay, thank you very much. Can I just follow on one item? So the classical Heisenberg chain at T equals about 0.2 has very beautiful KPZ scaling. <laughs> um, so this is just uh, another fact about the simplest of <laughs> all spin chains. And you know, it's, I guess, believed that it goes away to become diffusive at longer times, but the crossover time is enormous. It's like, you know, 10 to the four or something like this. It's really big. Um, in general, yeah, okay. it seems like, yeah, yes, I do. Um, so one uh, thing um, before I take questions. Um, so I was asked, uh, as you've seen in the chat, to announce that there's going to be a, um, um, a poster session at, I think, say, 8 p.m. my time, so that would be 2 p.m. Um, Eastern. Um, so after the this session, after a break, essentially, so please come back for this. And now I think Greg was had a question. Did I see that correctly? I think I think Greg had the applause emoji, but there is a question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, it was not a question. It was, the, it was clapping hands. Okay, are there any other questions? In chat, there's a question. Uh, okay. Yeah, I think I can see that one. So it's... Uh, are there other experimental techniques? Okay, so first, yeah, why is high temperature and low frequency important? So uh, low frequency is important because we want to get um, the, the longest time scales are where we expect the, the scaling to set in. So in other words, there's some kind of transient behavior at short times. And then if we wait long enough, we will see 
uh, the asymptotic scaling. Of course, if we waited too long, we would see diffusion, I think, in a real solid. Um, the high temperature, uh, that's again, yeah, at low temperature, effectively, the, the time that you have to go to to see KPZ becomes longer. Um, so if you, if you okay, so for, for, for this particular solid, we couldn't go to low temperature because of the 3D crossover. But let's say you were doing the atomic experiment where you really had maybe just a single chain. Um, then the challenge would be if you wait, uh, you know, if you, if you want to go to lower temperatures, you would also have to go to even lower frequencies in order to get to the right time scale. And, and there's, yeah, it, what you would, what you tend to see at uh, short times is more ballistic behavior. Um, and then you cross over to KPZ. Uh, that was, uh, if you want more details, that's kind of in uh, this paper. Uh, so the second question about other experimental tools. Yeah, actually, for this crossover, what we thought might be an even better tool than neutron scattering was NMR. Um, so NMR basically measures the autocorrelator. So like uh, S at one site at time zero and time T. And we, we, we talk about some detailed predictions for how NMR might be able to resolve the KPZ to Luttinger liquid crossover. Um, I think optics can measure spin-spin correlation functions. And there's some very beautiful work on like spin transport and gallium arsenide with optics and so on. Uh, I don't, I, the problem, yeah, with the optics, I guess you kind of need the right material to be able to measure spin correlation functions well. Um, I, I did think that optics was probably the right way to do that kind of expanding blob of energy in a Luttinger liquid. In fact, it would be like these old, like Dines, Bob Dines experiments and, and Hensel maybe, if I have that name right, uh, where you're looking at spread of energy in a solid. Here, you'd want to do the same thing, just at low temperature with a Luttinger liquid material. So I think um, the things I might try with optics are the spread of energy in a Luttinger liquid, where it's kind of like a pump probe. You heat one region and you watch the energy spread. Um, and then if you have a, a good way to measure the same thing that's measured in neutron scattering or NMR, we do have predictions for those as well.